Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond, and if you're new to this series, we built this five acre pond over the past year, and it took us several months to get all of the dirt excavated, and we had to bring in several truckloads of clay, and we also built an island, a dock, and got all the structure in place, and then it took a couple of months to get it full of water. After that, we stocked it with a bunch of bait fish, including bluegills and threadfin shad, and not long after that, we stocked it with these little two inch aggressive bass. And we're going to be giving you an update on them here in just a minute and showing you how big they've gotten. But spring is in the air, and it's my favorite time of year because the wildlife is abundant, the fish are spawning, and we got the water in our newest pond crystal clear. So we're going to be doing a fish feeding, feeding our two youngest bass. But the big surprise is how aggressive the rainbow trout are. I never saw that one coming. But as always, the wildlife feeding cams are carrying the series. And I always find it amazing how entertaining wildlife can be. Just hit the record button. And the animals always find a way to put on a show. <laughs> so you'll be seeing flying squirrels, as well as George Jones the possum. And for those of you that have been asking about some old school fishing videos, I got something special for you at the end of this video. You're not going to want to miss it. So if you followed along with this pond build series, you've seen the wildlife habitat it created. And you've probably noticed that due to my engineering background, I'm always looking for ways to incorporate technology at the farm to monitor the wildlife and see the sides of nature we don't always get to see. For instance, the underwater fish cams, eagle nest camera, and our most recent project of installing antennas in the pond to track the fish's activity. And sometimes we go a little bit overboard and install a splash pad and irrigation system for the duck house. But as most of you know, there are plenty of challenges when it comes to rural farm areas and technology. And in the past, I've even thought about setting up a live stream on the fish feeders and letting some of you subscribers control the fish feedings throughout the day. But I didn't have power or cellular connection at the feeder. And there's been times where I wanted to automate everyday pond tasks, like turning on the well water to fill up the pond, and once it reaches a certain level, then automatically turning itself off. But I didn't have that capability. So about a year ago, I joined a company called Field Micro to build a product called the FieldBot. And the FieldBot is equipped with a solar panel, to provide all of its necessary power and an HD camera for live viewing. But most importantly, it has the ability to automate tasks like turning on and off pumps, feeders, fans, as well as opening and closing gates. And we designed it to be weatherproof and waterproof and work in even the most remote locations in the world. It has built-in temperature, humidity, and air pressure sensors and also connects to Wi-Fi or cellular networks. But before we get into any more details on the field bot, I wanted to give you a quick background on how it got started. So the company Field Micro was founded by an Australian cotton farmer named Mitch. And Mitch grew up on a farm, so he designed the original FieldBot prototypes with farmers in mind to help automate those everyday tasks and save farmers time and money. And Mitch just happened to be following along the Pond Build series, and he reached out to discuss the product he was working on. And after some discussions, we both agreed that field bots could be used for multiple scenarios, including pond management. So you could connect a water clarity sensor to the field bot and have it send you a text when the water visibility is greater than 24 inches so you know it's time to fertilize. Or maybe a low level sensor installed on the dock so that when the water levels drop during a drought, the field bot receives the low level signal and turns on the well to pump fresh water back in the pond until it's full. So the plan was to build a universal field bot that can work with all sensors and bring automation to even the most remote locations. And the next step was designing a user interface that we call Smart Farm. And Smart Farm would become the command and control center for all the field bots. Once you're in Smart Farm, you can see all the connected field bots on a live satellite feed and you can view the onboard camera. And you can also turn on their microphone, which turns out to be a really neat feature. So let's say that you command a diesel pump to turn on. If the microphone doesn't hear the pump turn on, then you'll receive an alert. Or if you had a field bot installed on a fish or deer feeder and the feeder was running, if the microphone didn't hear the feed coming out, it would notify you that the feeders were empty. And I'm personally even gonna set one up here at the waterfall and use it to control the pumps and control the amount of water that flows down through the waterfalls based on when I'm out here or away. So the possibilities truly are endless. But back to the smart farm, you're able to see all of your connected sensors right here in the app. The onboard temp, humidity, or barometric pressure, plus any of the external sensors are going to be displayed here in the lower left. And if you have multiple field bots, you can set up automation between them. 
For example, if you have two field bots on opposite sides of the farm, one could turn the irrigation water on, and once the moisture probe connected to the second field bot registered water, then it would turn the irrigation pump off. And Smart Farm was also designed to connect to third-party APIs, like tractors, satellites, and weather, and that helps increase the efficiency of your land or farm. But just like I've done with all of my previous projects, I want to include you all in this journey. And I've gotten some great ideas from you in the past. So if you have any ideas on how we can make the field bot or smart farm better, even if it's going to solve a completely unrelated problem, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So we're finalizing on the hardware design now and getting ready for production. So any changes or improvements have to happen now. And we're also going to send about 5 to 10 of our final prototypes out to some of you that are interested in helping us do some field testing. So if you're interested in the product or want to give us some feedback, check out fieldmicro.com where you can join the waitlist or leave us a message. And we're going to be sending out all the pricing information by email to those of you that sign up once we've got it finalized. And you know I'm going to add some discounts to my subscribers that join in on the launch. But if you don't want to enter your information on the site, feel free to leave a comment down below or you can email me directly at steven at fieldmicro.com. And we look forward to hearing your feedback and I'll be giving you updates on the project in our upcoming videos. So if you missed the last video, we spent a good bit of time cleaning out the wetland filter and that fixed all of our water clarity issues. Now we have crystal clear water and I love it because you can see down in the bottom and watch all the fish interacting with the fish caves. We even got one of the little ninja turtles popping its head out. But the pitcher plants are blooming. The Japanese maple's putting on its leaves. Little birdies are stopping by. But I'll have to say that the coolest thing is watching the two bass we call Johnny and June. So every time I walk up to the pond's edge, they come rushing over. And at first I thought they were just trying to greet me. But I realized it's because I'm pushing those little minnows out of the shallow water. And as they start getting out there in the deeper area, the bass begin patrolling them and looking for those easy meals. But I really like it because since they're this young, they're not scared of human presence at all. And that reminds me a lot of Moby. We started him out when he was just a couple inches long and he grew up with us. So he enjoyed it when we came around because he always knew it was gonna be feeding time. And speaking of feeding time, I wanted to add a few new shiners into this pond. And I was pretty surprised by the reaction of the rainbow trout. Check this out. Alrighty, stocking some fresh golden shiners in the new pond. Look who's down there eating. I don't know if you guys can see it. Man. Look at there. Wow. The trout are aggressive. Man. And I've tried to start feeding the bluegills some pellets because I know they like them and I caught them right there at the feeder but they're still not having it yet. And today's video is brought to you by Factor. And for those of you that have watched my channel over the past several years, you know how much I love to cook. But I have to admit, when you have those busy days where you're spending all your time on projects, there's nothing better than coming home to a pre-cooked, healthy meal. But the first thing that impressed me about Factor is their meal selections, because they have a lot of the types of food I like to eat. Steak, chicken, fish, vegetables, but one thing I really like is they typically add some sort of sauce or different cheeses and will sometimes even spice it up. And Factor even offers meals for different types of diets, including keto, low calorie, or vegetarian. And they have over 27 different meal options each week. And a typical meal plan will range from 4 to 18 meals per week. And you can even add or reduce that number based on your specific needs. And one of the best parts is there's no prep work or mess to clean up. And since the meals aren't frozen, all you have to do is spend about two minutes heating them up and it's time to eat. So if you're interested in checking them out, either click the link in my video description or head over to go.factor75.com and use code BAMABASSAPR50 for 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. And you can also scan that QR code down below. And for a little added bonus, they also send out smoothies or keto shakes, which are a perfect little snack for days out here at the pond. Gotta love it. Now let's check in on the pair of eagles that we call Sam and Dixie. But it's tough to explain to you how happy I was when I saw the eagle land right here on the perch by Cedar Falls. So back in November when the Aquascape guys were in town, I was telling them about the eagle tower I built. And Greg told me he was going to put this particular piece of wood here for the eagle. So it's just really cool to see that when you design something specifically for a rare bird like the eagle, 
And when they actually come in and use it just like planned, it's tough to beat that. But I want to tell you guys a story about the eagle and its nemesis, the crow. So there's an old tale out there that I'm not sure if it's true or not. But the story basically says that there's only one bird out there brave enough to mess with an eagle. And that's the crow. And as you'll see throughout these videos, the eagle's content and peaceful, but the crow is always pestering him. And the story says that the crow will land on the eagle's back and peck at his neck. But the eagle doesn't attempt to shake it off or fight it or spend its time or energy on the small nuisance. But it just opens its wings and continues to rise higher into the sky. And the higher the flight, the harder it is for the crow to breathe and hold on until it eventually falls off due to a lack of oxygen. So the moral of the story is, don't spend your time fighting crows. Just keep ascending. <laughs> so I'm not sure if there's any truth to that story at all. But I can confirm the crows are the only ones brave enough to mess with the eagle. But I love watching the eagle tower cam because you never know what you're going to see. Pay close attention to the bass splashing right beside Alcatraz Island. And the eagle notices that the bass actually knocked a little bluegill up onto the island. And watch him fly down there and grab that little bluegill off the bank. <laughs> that is just wild. It's incredible to see how good their eyesight is. And the bass got the assist on that one. And we got Dixie here giving Sam an earful. And they're just like an old married couple. That's that. If you got something to say, just go ahead and say it, look. And I'm not sure whose doggo this is, but he found the pond and has been stopping by to take a quick bath. And I was down there looking at the animal tracks in the sand and had no clue what it was. <laughs> and it's because this pup loves rolling in the sand. He's got a lot of spunk. So about twice a year, I'll sink some brush piles. And in the summertime, I'll sink them out deep because that's where all the fish are hanging out. But this time of year, you can see we got all these little small bait fish hanging out right here in the shallow parts. And they don't have a ton of places to hide. You can see where I've added some tops there. And there's some more brush piles we sank last year. But the key is to get that leafy brush in there, kind of like this brush right here. And if you can see, we got a couple of tilapia sitting right there up under it. I had no idea any of the tilapia survived last year. But that leafy stuff gives all those little small bait fish that are cruising these banks right here. It gives them a place to hide and grow up a little bit. And you don't want all the bluegills and smaller bait fish getting eaten right after the spawn. So we're going to go build them a new home. And sinking the tops are pretty simple. Just get you a block, some wire. And I like to lay some of the bushy ends on each side. And then wrap that wire and block right there in the center. There's a look at the final product. Let's go drop it off. And you want to target those spawning areas. So if you remember, we put pea gravel all around the island right here. So a lot of bluegills are going to spawn. And when those little fry hatch out, they can come and swim right over here to this and be protected. All right, let's see if I can do this with one hand. Perfect little setup for them. All right, just like another one. Right over here by where we pump the water in, in this little cove. That's usually a good spawning ground right over there. All right, just sink the last one over here by the Cedar Falls feeder. It's right there, you can barely see the top of it. But if you remember, we have a road bed that comes out right here that we put a lot of gravel out on. And there's always a bunch of beds right there.
So in the last couple videos, we installed these pit tag antennas. So when any of the bass that have been tagged in the pond swim near or through one of the antennas, it scans it back to a data logger. And as you can see, I found a really easy way to scan these fish and see who it is that's hanging out here around the dock. Just toss some shiners out there and they'll swim right through it. But now that we're starting to collect a lot of data, I got a few ideas of things I want to do with it. And one of the cool things about the data logger is it logs the exact time that the fish swam by it. So as we compile all of these successful scans, it should start showing us when these bass are the most active. So it's one of those questions I've always wanted to know. Do bass feed more at nighttime than they do during the day? Or are they really territorial and basically stay in one part of the pond? But what I'm starting to see is dozens of fish swimming through each of these areas that are basically community spots. What's really interesting is that some fish will just register one ping every other day. But then you have a couple of bass, for instance, Seminole, one of the big Florida strain females we put in, she actually swims by the Oak Throne almost once every hour some days. And it may just be that Seminole's a really active fish that hadn't found a spot to settle in, but I've already learned a lot from the couple of weeks of having these antennas. So if you guys have any other ideas of things we can test out with the data, leave it in a comment below. And here's a quick look at a spreadsheet and you'll have the fish's name and then the number in parentheses right beside it is how many times that fish was scanned. And it basically scans once per second. So Lily hung out in that area for eight seconds. But we got a new leader when it comes to the most successful scans and that's Excalibur, who hung out around the Oak Throne for roughly 2,723 seconds. But the plan is to start creating some graphs, showing the most active fish per location, and also making this live and accessible so you guys can view it anytime. And we've got Nate Makes building a squirrel house, and last week I installed a bunch of squirrel feeder stations around the farm so we could monitor which areas were the most active. And right out of the gate, we had some installation issues because we didn't factor in the weight of raccoons. But I left the camera rolling and was surprised to see the amount of wildlife that used this big old oak tree as its home. We got George Jones, a little field mice, and now that we started seeing some squirrel activity, I decided it was time to go ahead and properly install the nut bar. And there's a good look at the massive oak. No telling what all animals are up there right now. We got another surprise with a big rat. And it was interesting to see that he just grabbed one nut and got out of there. But the star of this show is the bandit raccoon. And it's been very entertaining watching him interact with the nut bar. So at first, when there were plenty of nuts, no problem at all. But the raccoon was the only one intrigued enough to try to break into the nut vault and access the full stash. And watch him try to learn how the door slides up and down. And he's working hard and he's pretty efficient. Now on the other hand, we all know George Jones has gotten old and he's doing all he can just to make it up to the nut bar. But he's not as strong as he once was. And down he goes. But the raccoon is determined to figure out this puzzle and is not gonna let it beat him. George is struggling just to even get close to him. But these are my favorite shots. You can see the raccoon weaving his hand in and out of the little bar stools, making sure he cleans everything out and no food left behind. So the nut bar was definitely a success and a possible location for the squirrel house. We just have to make sure to build the entrance small enough that the raccoon and George can't get into it. Now on to location number two, the peanut picnic table with the umbrella. And I think it's wild that we even captured a squirrel on this table sitting up under an umbrella. <laughs> But he's very upset that there's not any nuts there. And he's got a special message just for me. <laughs> and that's more nuts. But this little guy's so mad at me that he's even starting to chew into the picnic table. So I'm going to need to increase the capacity of the nuts in this area so we don't have any more angry flying squirrels. So now that we got crystal clear water in Cedar Falls, we can start watching some footage from some of the underwater cams. But the first thing I was really surprised to see was that as the water cleared up, the complexion and patterns on the bass changed. So if you noticed in the past video, so if you noticed in the last video, the very back edge of their tail was black, almost like somebody took a paintbrush and painted it. But now that we have clear water, their lateral line looks a lot more distinguished and that black tail has completely disappeared. But like I already mentioned, there's a lot of similarities to these two fish and Moby. I can already see that Johnny and June are going to have a big personality because they get into everything. They're always swimming around, investigating the cameras, checking every little crack for a minnow, 
So these guys are going to be a lot of fun to watch. We also had a quick glimpse at one of the bluegills and a fish cave cam. It's interesting to see that all the fish are using them. And now that the water's cleared up, it's nice to have because of the eagles and ospreys. But so far, none of the birds have messed with them. So I was thinking that this was a rat snake and just wanted to get your guys' opinion on it. Nah, I'm just kidding. But this is my yearly public service reminder to all those turkey hunters out there. Make sure to wear some good boots. And speaking of squirrels, here's a clip of a whitish gray fox squirrel. And it's interesting how some of them have that orange look and others have this white look. Now let's check out the pond with the night lights on. We've got everything lit up. You can see all the bait fish have spread out and are not really grouped up together at night. And I'm sure there's some fish down there on the hunt. I've thought about adding a few more lights, but I don't want to make it too bright so that the predators like raccoons can come hunt at night. So I'm probably going to leave it like it is. And speaking of nighttime hunters, we got Hooter the Owl. And it's been a little while since we've seen him. But Hooter, I got some big rats out there I may need you to take care of. So I hope you guys had a good Easter. Oliver sure was happy that the Easter Bunny visited him out here at the farm. Couldn't quite figure out what to do with a bucket, so he just put it on his head. And I got Sarah out here working with me on the tractor, but after a while she made a stop and take a break and go for a little hay ride around the farm. And that turned out to be a pretty good idea. So all the oak trees are doing good. Leaves are starting to fill in. Even got a cypress right there that's budding out. But I have a question about one of these big oak trees we just planted. So we most recently planted these two, and this one's doing good except for at the very top. It doesn't have any leaves or buds at the very top. I'm thinking that could be a sign of something wrong with it. So let me know if you guys have seen anything like that. Because we've had a couple dozen of that same variety out here and hadn't had that issue with any of them. All right, folks, out here gonna do a little fishing. We're right here in the middle of the spring. The bass should have been spawning. In March and April, you should see, you know, some red tails or maybe even some post-spawn fish. But with all the little bass swimming around the edges, I'm very confused this year, but you know how we do it. Every time we catch a fish, we'll scan it to see if it's ever been caught before. If not, we'll inject a tag. And I'm thinking the water's warm enough, we can try the old frog. There we go. On the frog. <laughs> That's a good one too. That's a nice, healthy fish. Looks like we got spawning activity. Red tail. Wow, this fish has never been caught. That's incredible to be that big. All right, her tag's gonna be 570589. 2.57 pounds. <laughs> caught it right here. He's sitting right under that tree. This guy's not been caught. But his tag's gonna be 570499 with a weight of 1.63. Look at there, we got another red tail. Ooh, right there at the lily pads. Good one, too. He was sitting there waiting on that frog. All right, this fish been caught 569920. It weighs 1.74 pounds. <laughs> That's too much fun. Oh, this has been caught. 570064. And it weighs 1.38. It's a little light bite. Might be a big fish, then. Yeah, it is a big one. Lily pads are the hot spot. Haven't been caught. And it weighs 1.82. And now it's time to feed Tiger. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this video. Let me know your thoughts on the field bot and make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay up to date on all the ponds and wildlife. But I hope you all enjoyed this one and we will see you all next time.